Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome you back from uh, Thanksgiving break here. Um, hope everybody has uh, been safe and had an enjoyable um, socially distanced holiday. I, I do want to um, give a, a note of thanks to uh, sponsorship for this session to Lilly Oncology. Um, we, is, uh, we are very grateful for their uh, generosity. Um, it's really a pleasure this morning to introduce two um, outstanding experts in the field of thyroidology. Um, this morning, Dr. Kate Newbold, who is a consultant in clinical oncology specializing in the treatment of head, neck, and thyroid cancer at Royal Marsden Hospital and a senior lecturer at the Institute of Cancer Research in London. Um, Dr. Newbold undertook research at the Royal Marsden and was awarded an MD in research. Um, from the University of London. Um, her research interests span both head, neck, and thyroid cancers, and functional imaging applied to the management of head and neck cancers um, was her, the specific focus of her research. Um, and uh, she is now the, recip the recipient of a cancer research program grant. Um, current research in thyroid, cancer, in thyroid cancer includes dosimetric delivery of uh, radioisotopes, novel therapeutic um, uh, systemic therapies and molecular profiling, um, as well as investigating the role of liquid biopsies of circulating DNA um, as a biomarker for uh, disease management. Uh, um, Dr. Newbold is on the board of directors of the International Thyroid Oncology Group, a member of the um, European Thyroid Association Cancer Research Network and National Cancer Research Institute. Um, in head, neck, and thyroid clinical studies in the UK. Um, our discussant this morning is uh, Dr. Bruce Colney, who is a medical oncologist at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. He is an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I've had the pleasure of working closely with Dr. Colney for the past uh, 16 years in the management of both head, neck, and thyroid cancer patients. Dr. Coney has a clinical focus in the management of head and neck cancers, including thyroid and salivary gland. He is dedicated to providing multidisciplinary care uh, to this group of patients. He is the co-chair of the Mount Sinai Health System Head and Neck Disease Focus Group um, and has been an investigator um, for various head and neck clinical, cancer clinical trials. Uh, he serves on the executive committee of the New York Head and Neck Society. And so with that, um, as always, I encourage all of our participants to write in their questions um, on uh, during the course of the presentation, and I will do my best, as always, uh, to get to those before the end of the hour. Uh, so without taking any, up more, any more time, uh, Kate, thank you once again for joining us. So thank you very much for um, the invitation uh, to uh, present this paper. Um, it's a privilege to be on the meeting. Um, so I will now start uh, the talk. I'm just trying to get rid of myself um, on here um, so that I can see the slides. So um, the paper that you've asked me to discuss um, is a, a paper that was um, published um, in Cancer Treatment Reviews in 2018. Uh, this was led by um, my colleagues in Spain, Jomi Captavilla and Enrique Grande, um, and and it is entitled Optimization of Treatment uh, with Lembatinib in Radioactive Iodine Refractory uh, Differentiated Thyroid Cancer. So the background to this um, setting up this publication and this uh, consensus um, uh, document was that was the management of iodine refractory thyroid cancer. So um, as we know, approximately 60% of um, patients um, with um, uh, uh, sorry, just moving the go to webinar out of the way, um, will become refractory to radioiodine. And that is a major um, prognostic factor when a patient becomes refractory. When patients are still taking up iodine in their um, advanced thyroid cancer, they can have 10 year survival rates of up to around 60%. But as soon as that disease becomes refractory to iodine, which is such a useful and efficacious treatment, that um, survival rate, rate will, will plummet to around 10%. So it's really important to make absolutely sure that you are correct, that the patient has become refractory and not to throw out a very useful treatment uh, option. 
And multi-kinase inhibitors over the last couple of um, years, five years, have really provided us now with a disease-modifying treatment option uh, for this set of patients. So what is the management of iodine refractory uh, thyroid cancer? Well, we consider locally ablative treatments for symptom control. So if a patient has a specific lesion that's causing a problem, uh, then initially we would consider uh, localized treatments such as radiotherapy, surgery, or radiological uh, interventions just to try to hold off the time when we need to start systemic therapies. And of course, these can also be done alongside the systemic therapy. The whole redifferentiation story has uh, waxed and waned over, over history, uh, moving from lithium to retinoids, uh, histone deacetylase uh, inhibitors, and more recently MEK inhibitors, but really hasn't progressed to a clinically useful uh, setting yet, uh, although we are still uh, awaiting um, uh, some of the trial results and data with the MEK inhibitors for this um, scenario. So if we move on to the um, actual disease modifying treatments that we have, these are targeted therapies. Uh, those that are approved are serafinib based on the decision trial data and lenvatinib based on the select trial data. And other targeted therapies that are uh, we have emerging data with or have some data but are uh, perhaps unfunded or unapproved are in this list of multi-kinase inhibitors. Uh, but also specific for BRAF uh, mutated um, tumors with dibrafenib and bemurafenib, and coming into the, the um, arena now, the checkpoint inhibitors uh, with um, immuno-oncology as well. So it's really um, the background of the two uh, um, multi-kinase inhibitors, serafinib and lenvatinib, that we have available for this population of patients at the moment. Uh, you'll note that the, both of these were phase three randomized controlled trials. The decision study published in The Lancet in 2014, followed swiftly by the SELECT study in the NEJM in uh, 2015. Um, and both of these had improved progression-free survival uh, rates over placebo, um, with uh, uh, hazard ratios that were impressive for oncology trials, uh, 0.59 within the decision study and 0.21 in uh, the uh, SELECT study with lenvatinib. And I'll come on to this in a little bit more detail. So the, the um, the SELECT study, which is the background to the publication that I'm discussing today, uh, was published um, by Martin Schlumberger uh, in New England Journal of Medicine 2015. It was a phase three multi-center randomized controlled trial, randomizing between placebo and lenvatinib. Lenvatinib is a multi-kinase inhibitor uh, and its targets are, list, uh, are shown here. So the vascular endothelial growth factor receptors one to three, fibroblast uh, growth factor receptor, um, the um, platelet-derived growth factor receptors, RET and KIT. And the criteria for um, enrollment in the study was that the patients had uh, radiological progressing disease by resist criteria, two to one randomization, randomization in favor of the lenvatinib. And there was crossover uh, on progression and patients who had uh, already had systemic therapy were um, permitted into this study as well. So, um, this was the uh, exciting um, outcome with progression-free survival that we saw from this study. And this, this really uh, was uh, quite significant um, for those of us that manage um, iodine refractory uh, thyroid uh, uh, cancer patients. So here we can see that uh, with lenvatinib over placebo, there was a significant improvement in progression-free survival with lenvatinib um, uh, arm taking 18.3 months to uh, progress compared to placebo at 3.6 uh, months uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.2, um, uh, which was highly significant. And I think what was particularly interesting to me as a, a clinician treating these patients was that we were getting partial responses. So in the decision study published the year before with serafinib, patients mainly had stable disease, which was a result in itself. Um, but progression, um, a partial response was encouraging because this meant that we could reduce the disease bulk uh, for our patients and potentially improve uh, symptoms as a result of that. 
It's also important to know that these drugs do take a while to show effect. So um, the median time to response of two months, you know, this isn't an instant um, solution. Uh, so if a patient has an obstructing lesion or something that needs uh, instant um, or more timely, more rapid uh, response, then we're still looking at perhaps a locally ablative or a stenting process to ease symptoms in the first place. A subsequent uh, publication by Marsha Bros in 2017 in JCO had looked at a subgroup analysis of these patients uh, for overall survival, particularly uh, in uh, looking at ages of patients. So there was a concern that perhaps elderly patients wouldn't tolerate these drugs, and um, specifically lenvatinib, so well. Um, but what was pleasing in looking at this and teasing out this, this group was that actually uh, those over 65 uh, showed an overall survival benefit. And so certainly we shouldn't be excluding uh, the older uh, uh, end of our um, patient spectrum uh, from uh, this uh, drug. Now, of course, this um, benefit doesn't come for free and um, there is a significant cost to patients in, uh, coming, uh, in taking lenvatinib. This uh, uh, select trial data on the adverse events is, you know, quite um, uh, significant in showing that 97% of patients had uh, treatment emergence uh, uh, adverse events, which is which is highly, uh, which is a high number. And when you look at those and break them down, almost 70% had problems with hypertension, 60% with diarrhea. The, the sort of more nebulous uh, symptoms of fatigue, asthenia, anorexia, again, between 50 and 60%. And um, over, almost 70% having to have their dose uh, reduced, over 80% having to have an interruption in their medication, and 14% uh, having to be discontinued. And not to um, uh, ignore the fact that six patients uh, had fatal um, adverse events felt to be related to the treatment. So this is not a drug that is um, a a miracle in that we don't know that um, in the whole population that the uh, overall survival is improved. The, the um, data shown by Marsha Brose's um, article is, is helpful and encouraging. Uh, and it's certainly not a, a drug that that has a, um, um, a small impact um, on quality of life of our patients. And therefore, we have to be very careful in our selection of patients and, and also on the decision of when to start. And this table just shows you the whole range of those adverse events um, found within that uh, select um, uh, study. So with the advent of both serafinib and lenvatinib, we've got patients that are living with disease, but also with treatment-related uh, morbidity. And if you take the median duration of treatment in the SELECT trial, for, which was just uh, under 14 months um, for those achieving a radio, um, in, in the total number, but, and for those achieving really good radiological response, uh, 33 months these patients were on drug. And the median dose intensity had, was two to three levels reduced down from the initial 24 milligram of starting dose. So we have patients that are going to be on a drug for a long period of time, uh, that are going to be affected by these uh, toxicities, and these toxicities are going to limit the dose intensity. And this was then picked up uh, in a post hoc analysis by Tahara that really uh, showed that uh, there was a problem with uh, outcomes being affected in the dose interruptions within the SELECT study. So in patients that had interruptions, the mean lenvatinib dose um, was down at 17.2 milligrams a day rather than the 24 milligrams that was set out. So they looked and dichotomized the patients into two groups to have a look and see how this impacted on the outcome. And it dichotomized these into patients who had a dose of interruption of less than 10% of their total treatment duration and those who had greater than 10% of um, duration. And this was interesting in that those with shorter dose interruption had a better dose intensity, managing 20, just over 20 milligrams a day per patient, um, uh, versus those with the longer dose interruptions, that where really the, the dose intensity was around was 14.6 milligrams per day. And this was borne out um, when looking at the progression-free survival. So the top line here, the patients who had less than 10% of their treatment duration interrupted um, because of toxicities, clearly did better than those who had more than 10% uh, 
of dose interruption. Admittedly, those still did better than uh, placebo, but there's quite a significant difference there. So it's on this background that uh, Jaume Captavia set up a meeting of specialists in Europe uh, in the management of um, iodine refractory um, thyroid cancer, because we felt as a group that actually our experience of managing these patients was that we could keep these patients on uh, a, a better dose intensity than perhaps the select study uh, uh, um, showed, um, because I think with experience of managing patients on these drugs, uh, you can mitigate the adverse uh, events and maintain patients on uh, a, a reasonable dose of lenvatinib without so many dose interruptions. And so the aim of his uh, getting us together was to review and provide healthcare professionals with a series of specific recommendations for the optimization of lenvatinib therapy in order to maintain dose intensity and therefore hopefully to um, uh, 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 maximize the uh, outcome in terms of survival benefit for patients receiving the drug. And on this group, there were oncologists, endocrinologists, nuclear medics, nephrologists, uh, and cardiologists, uh, together with uh, in, um, support from a dermatologist uh, as well. So the sum of the paper sort of addresses the following. When to start treatment and the screening of patients up front, assessments prior to starting lenvatinib, uh, how we start the dose, um, and then looking specifically at uh, adverse events, including cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, renal, and dermatological, as well as some others. Looks at drug interactions, specific populations um, that uh, may require dose reductions uh, up front. And so whilst the text provides uh, all the background, there was a, a real aim to try and provide summary tables and flow diagrams that were perhaps a little bit more accessible uh, to clinicians rather than having to trawl through uh, reams of text. So if we um, start by looking at um, the patient, patient selection, I think what we really wanted to emphasize to um, clinicians uh, it, when they're managing patients on lenvatinib is, is selecting when to start and, and how to optimize patients prior to starting uh, this treatment. So really, we, wanted to, we want to start this treatment in patients before they become profoundly symptomatic. Um, uh, but obviously, if, if the tumor is growing slowly and patients are extremely well, then that balance of benefit um, between uh, potential progression-free survival uh, improvement versus the morbidity is perhaps not so clear-cut. So you need to be uh, monitoring your patients so that you can assess really the, the volume of disease, the sites of disease, and the likelihood that they're going to cause um, uh, problems imminently, uh, together with the, um, the rate of progression. And so as you monitor your patients, uh, both biochemically, clinically, and radiologically, you should get a feel of all these things um, over uh, months to years. And then there will be some patients where it's clear that you're going to need to start, where the progression is rapid and the volume of diseases is large and the symptoms are there. Um, but there are other patients that, you know, uh, really need to be discussed on a case by case um, basis. And we recommend that that's done in a multidisciplinary setting uh, because of all the different uh, potential uh, uh, locally ablative treatments that can be offered by different specialists. As well as that, once you've decided that the patient needs to start some systemic therapy, then it's sensible to really optimize their general health um, prior to that. Um, and so taking a good history of their comorbidities, uh, their co-medications, uh, and making sure that things such as hypertension um, uh, are, are, is all um, well managed before uh, initiating lenvatinib. Um, and then the other issue is once patients start on these drugs, you need to review them regularly, certainly um, fairly frequently. We would say weekly to two weekly within the first two months and then monthly up to 18 months or so after they're, they're on the drug. And therefore, these patients need to be aware that they're going to be coming up to hospital or visiting their local um, uh, medic uh, for blood pressure tests, bl um, blood tests, urine analysis. Uh, regularly that may last for many years. And so they need to be up for that, uh, for, for safe administration of this drug. Uh, 
And this um, flow diagram, again, is just a, supposed to be there to guide and help um, clinicians work out when to select a patient to start uh, with uh, lenvatinib. And again, it's just reiterating a lot of the things that I've already uh, been over. Um, prevention of potential uh, adverse events, so looking at those things, particularly, high, um, particularly blood pressure, cardiovascular status, uh, and renal function um, before starting the patients. We know that really good education uh, for the patient and their carers is uh, really beneficial in maintaining a patient on the drug uh, and, and minimizing side effects. If you can help patients understand how to look after themselves, uh, particularly things like the skin um, to prevent skin toxicity, um, if they know how to do that and know who to contact at an early stage when these um, uh, uh, adverse events start to rear their head, then we can really nip them in the bud and maintain the patient on, on drug. And then managing the uh, adverse events, of course, our goal is to maintain the patient on a decent dose of lenvatinib without interruptions and dose reductions. Um, and therefore, um, as I said, early intervention um, in sorting out uh, emergent uh, adverse events is, is really critical. And then once started, uh, we really um, uh, advocate close monitoring um, uh, and potential um, dose reductions uh, if the patient is not managing. Stopping treatment, well, we'll come on to that, but really um, that, that is fairly clear cut if the patient is uh, progressing on drug, um, but also obviously if there's unacceptable toxicity despite all your supportive measures, um, and of course if the patient requests coming off. So looking specifically um, at some of the adverse uh, events, we had great input from uh, cardiology, nephrology, uh, dermatology to help um, design some of these. And you'll notice we do have some Spanish that has crept in or remained in uh, throughout this document. Um, uh, but um, this from the cardiovascular uh, side, really has talked about um, optimizing prior to starting with baseline, Echocardiography um, is the first option. Uh, if you can't get hold of that, then mugger scans uh, potentially can help. And then some guidance as to how to manage different um, aspects of cardiotoxicity, uh, so for heart failure, uh, cardi cardiac function, dysfunction, uh, coronary syndrome, because we know that um, this drug can um, initiate or, or, or um, um, uh, cause problems with vasospasm, thrombo thrombosis, and atherosclerosis formation. Arrhythmias uh, can be a problem and need to be dealt with. What we have difficulty with is oral anticoagulants in, in knowing um, or having evidence of what we can use alongside these um, drugs. Um, and therefore, this really has to be balanced, usually with input uh, of a cardiologist, to work out the balance between the need from the cardiology um, aspect and the um, progressing cancer and need to, keep, to maintain an anti-cancer um, uh, therapy. QTV, um, QT interval prolongation isn't such an issue with lenvatinib in my experience. We see it much more in other kinase inhibitors, for example, vandetanib uh, with medullary thyroid cancer. But um, equally, it is an issue that we need to monitor and, and uh, uh, keep an eye on. Um, uh, and guidance is given uh, for that. So lenvatinib is a potent, um, has a potent anti-VEGF um, role, and this we know uh, triggers both hypertension and proteinuria, which are, are um, uh, toxicities that can limit the dose and intensity of dosing of lenvatinib. This is partly we know that VEGF plays a regulatory role in homeostasis through the nitric oxide. Um, which dilates the small vessels and is key to the, the function of the microvascular network. It also um, regulates the endothelial function within the renal glomeruli. It interferes with the integrity of the podocytes within the glomeruli, so it has um, significant effect. This chart is supposed to provide a practical guide um, to managing hypertension. Just a reminder that in the SELECT study, almost 70% of patients on lenvatinib had some degree of high um, of hypertension, um, almost 43% of those greater than grade three. So, you know, this is 
this to me and in my practice is the most common and the most troublesome um, toxicity from lenvatinib and that it can be quite difficult to get on top of and so this guidance hopefully is, is helpful in in what to start as first line what to move on to second and third line together with considering um, uh, dose reductions of the lenvatinib itself um, and I find that working together with a cardiologist really helps uh, with with the um, optimal management of these patients and we're lucky that uh, certainly in my institution, we have a cardio-oncology clinic that we work uh, closely with, but that's a luxury. And so this guidance uh, certainly can help if, if that is not available. And just as an aside, it's interesting and, and it can be helpful when your patients are getting fed up with constant interventions for blood pressure and dose reductions and another antihypertensive being added in, is to, to point them in the direction of Professor Worth's publication in 2018, showing that actually treatment emergent hy hypertension with lenvatinib is probably a, a, a biomarker of, uh, of uh, progression-free survival advantage, um, but also of overall survival advantage. So this is useful just to have in the back of your mind and, and out of interest also, obviously, um, that this probably is a good biomarker for response. Proteinuria can be difficult to manage. Um, in my experience, most of the patients also have um, hypertension uh, and so uh, tend to be on ACE inhibitors, which hate, helps this. But again, this is a guide uh, based on the protein creatinine ratios um, uh, in the urine samples uh, to help um, identify how to manage the proteinuria. And it is recommended that we're testing for proteinuria during the monthly for the first three months uh, when starting on lenvatinib, which is the time when we most, most likely see it, but then to continue to monitor uh, maybe two to three monthly ongoing. And that will also, um, you know, if a patient's getting problems with unstable um, hypertension, uh, then again, just check the proteinuria at the same time. Dermatological A's in, um, with lenvatinib, I, I don't see as much, and I'm always surprised when I see this table from the select study saying that there were 32% uh, uh, with hand foot uh, syndrome. I mean, um, I don't see that so much, but clearly it has been a problem. Um, and it's a horrible situation, but it can be picked up at an early stage. Patients start by having some tenderness over pressure areas in the hands and the feet, which then lead on to um, hyperkeratotic lesions and, and to blisters. So you should be able to pick it up and ameliorate it before it gets to a grade three. Um, but this table um, was developed to try to help and give some guidance uh, as to how to manage the various derm potential dermatological toxicities. And it shouldn't be forgotten that there are some uh, contraindications really for lenvatinib. Um, we, we know that um, lenvatinib uh, has a risk of fist, uh, causing fistulation. So where patients have disease uh, involving the walls of um, things like trachea, esophagus, uh, and especially if they've been heavily pre-treated perhaps by external beam radiotherapy, then we do need to be aware that the the, the uh, risk of fistulation or perforation is high, and that really needs to be weighed up against the potential benefits of starting. And the same with um, hemorrhage. Um, uh, we know that bleeding uh, episodes are um, uh, increased when on lenvatinib, and so if there's a risk of uh, hemorrhage, then uh, this is, needs to be taken into account when consideration of initiation treatment and also when, when consenting the patient. Um, follow up again, um, we pushing and pushing the multidisciplinary aspect of this. We would hope that patients on these um, drugs and lenvatinib specifically in this context should be managed in a, an experienced multidisciplinary clinic um, where uh, initial follow up is perhaps up to weekly, I mean as frequently as weekly in the first couple of months to really get on top of toxicities before they become a problem and before they require dose reduction or dose interruption. And then once patients have settled out on a dose plus or minus supportive medication, um, then we see them monthly, but that from us is because of prescribing restrictions. Um, uh, we have to prescribe each month and continue to prove uh, benefits. 
Um, but later, if you don't have that restriction, then, you know, after 18 months or so when the drug uh, patients is stable, then certainly increasing the interval of monitoring and particularly in increasing the interval of scan so that you're not unnecessarily irradiating patients with whole body CT scans too frequently. Um, and again, from the adverse events and, and from the um, toxicity side of, of you, monitoring blood pressure, proteinuria, um, echocardiograms, um, this is uh, uh, some, a typo here, which is uh, omitted, um, the number six. So we would recommend six monthly um, echocardiograms, blood and urine analysis as well. Um, and the other thing that is important is, is monitoring the patient's weight, because that can be a silent sort of toxicity that you suddenly notice your patient has lost an awful lot of weight on this drug. And it's worth measuring, uh, weighing them every time you see them just to keep a track of that, uh, because it can occur quite uh, significantly. So I think just to conclude, this was, you know, this is a, a paper that's not new data, uh, so difficult to sort of uh, um, dissect it completely, um, but to try and walk you through it, uh, we know that our patients on lenvatinib will experience toxicities, and therefore we feel that it's critical to consider carefully the uh, time to initiate treatment uh, when really that balance between benefit and um, morbidity really swings in favour of benefit. We know that educating our patients and carers prior to starting lenvatinib will reduce the severity uh, of toxicities and hopefully reduce the need for drug uh, interruption and dose reduction. And the early intervention um, facilitated by regular reviews of emergent um, AEs with supportive measures really uh, also will help maintain dose intensity of the lenvatinib. We think that um, these adverse events are completely manageable and most of us have a better experience than the uh, data from the SELECT study would indicate. Um, that's born out of um, now having more than five years of experience of using this regularly since uh, um, approval of the drug and for many of us more than that having used it in the trials prior. Um, treatment emergent hypertension may be predictive of tumour response. Um, and as we've, we've um, emphasised, dose intensity is important. So I think I will leave it there um, and, uh, and hand over for uh, the discussant with Bruce. Um, uh, and then, of course, we'll uh, no doubt have some questions at the end of the session. So thank you very much. All right. So um, thanks for asking me to uh, participate in uh, this excellent uh, paper. Um, uh, you know, I have no financial disclosures. Um, I just, you know, want to first, uh, you know, also emphasize, um, you know, I, about considerations for treatment. We know that for uh, most importantly, uh, most of the patients who have uh, differentiated heart cancer do very well, and, and certainly I, I don't ever need to see them. But for those patients that do develop radioactive refractory uh, differentiated heart cancer, um, you know, it's not so good. Median survival historically has been described at, at three to five years. And as was mentioned earlier, you know, 10 year survival can decrease, you know, as low as uh, 10%. So often the first, uh, you know, decision is whether or not there are any candidates. This is very basic, but the first decision may be to determine whether or not there are any local therapies, uh, whether it's, you know, there's certainly local regional surgical options, uh, radiation options. Um, more important is when patients have more uh, disseminated or systemic disease, um, whether or not, you know, there is an indication for treatment, um, you know, including uh, multi-kinase inhibitor or other agents as discussed or observation. Um, observation often is the initial uh, recommendation of these patients. Many patients, as we know, do well for several years with uh, no treatment. And, and many times this decision is quite, quite easy. Um, we see a low amount of disease, very little progression, and so um, we really have to consider, you know, discussing with the patient benefits of observation versus not. Often there's a lot of anxiety um, for patients who have a metastatic disease, and sometimes they want to really consider therapy in it. So it's it's often a very uh, you know important uh, discussion before uh, starting any treatment. Um, and Jen briefly, as sort of discussed a bit, was when to consider treatment. 
uh, as I also agree, very important that um, multidisciplinary team approaches is, is absolutely essential. Um, if one is going to consider, you know, systemic therapy with lymphatic you know, here since it's a topic, um, but there should, you know, often be no recommended surgical radiation options. There should be clear evidence of increased tumor burden or acceleration of tumor growth, close proximity to vital organ structure. Also, I think if patient has multiple uh, areas of disease, if there is um, disease adjacent to vital structure or organ, then we have to make sure there is no uh, evidence or no indication for more localized therapy for that one side of disease. Also, you know, obviously symptoms attributed to recurrent metastatic disease. Clearly, we I think we all agree that we would like to in intercede prior to development of symptoms. Um, and the important thing is that once we do initiate treatment with lymphatinib, uh, you know, it's expected that treatment will continue until progressive disease or intolerable side effects. And for most patients, quality of life in some or in sometimes many respects will decrease. So I think that's why it's really imperative that um, we do not start treatment prior to uh, it's necessary. And I, you know, many times I, I do see patients where I really have to sort of push back a little bit about treatment just for these reasons. It's, you know, once you start, it doesn't stop. Um, the next couple of slides I'll go over a little quick because uh, Dr. Newell kind of went through some of the things that I was going to mention. Everybody is clear on this uh, trial that led to the FDA approval. Um, and as we heard, elbow criteria, just very brief, I'm not going to spend much time, you had to have refractory disease, and there had to be independent uh, reviewed radiologic evidence of disease progression within 13 months. As we heard, patients were randomized to lymphatinib, 24 placebo, and uh, patients could be, you know, we, the dose reduction often goes down, for, just so people don't know, from 24, 20, 14, or 10. Um, and patients could uh, receive, receiving placebo could go to uh, crossover to lymphatinib. Again, these were patients, uh, there were 261 in lymphatinib group, 131 in placebo. And as we saw, progression free survival was significantly at 18 point, significantly better, 18.3%. So I won't spend, we reviewed that already. Um, but also just looking at um, for efficacy, you can see even here, you can see even the uh, at 6, 12, 18, and 24 months, there was significant progression free survival, um, even at 24 months of 44% versus placebo. Um, interesting, and I think this was mentioned before as well, is uh, response rate was 64.8%, which is quite helpful, particularly when you know disease is causing symptoms and one hopes to uh, to see benefit. What's important, as also mentioned, was that response rate was great. It was seen very quickly at, at two months, and that was actually the first time of imaging. So it was the first imaging done in the study. So some patients may have even a more a more rapid response. So it's actually you know encouraging. Um, and uh, as far as progressive disease, you know about 6.9% did have progressive disease despite treatment. Um, and I also this is just to as we all know about the um, the purpose of the paper actually is trying to diminish toxicity uh, and manage toxicity so that we can keep you know patients on as much uh, drug as possible and again as was already mentioned I won't spend too much time but hypertension in this study you can see for grade three was 41.8 percent I agree with Dr. Newbold in my practice so when I have patients this can be one of the more significant uh, problems um, and these other I just put it most common but fatigue and asthenia also for me is that is a significant problem uh, for many patients here's 59 percent grade 3 9.2 and for me like I said for many patients that is a significant problem um, I do want to mention as uh, I think Dr. Numo did that there are infrequent but serious complications which include thromboembolic events hemorrhage, uh, renal failure, hepatic failure. These are percentage-wise is less than 2%, but GI fistulas, QT prolongation, and posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. These are very infrequent. But, and also mentioned that, you know, again, it's, when you are starting treatment and you have a patient who's asymptomatic, um, we have to keep in mind that uh, there are treatment-related fatal events, and it can occur, six people out of all those, but still 2.3%. Um, and, uh, Pulmonary embolism uh, occurred in one patient, hemorrhagic stroke, general deterioration, and there are three sudden deaths. 
if you look at discontinuous shift treatment, this was also discussed, it was 14.2% in the Levadin group. Dose interruption occurred in a high number of patients, you can see 82%. Um, dose reduction, 67%, and this just gives the, this already discussed as well. So, um, you know, I also, uh, as mentioned in the trial and, and sort of uh, discussed by the Newbold, that it is important to use the uh, highest uh, possible dose of lumbatinib, uh, hopefully for the longest period of time and uh, get the most, uh, get maximum disease control. This was just an, uh, a, another uh, subsequent uh, publication by uh, uh, same group who uh, published the initial trial. Um, looking at uh, tumor size over time, and this did show that increased lymphatic exposure, aired in the curve, was correlated with greater tumor size reduction during the first eight weeks, and the tumor size reduction correlated with treatment duration. Um, and this also, I won't then spend too much time, this also I think was important looking at dose interruption, so Dr. Newbold already showed this slide, looking at progression-free survival for patients who had a total dose interruption of less than 10%. We'll say that both arms, whether it was greater than 10%, still did better than placebo. Um, just to also uh, discuss patients who may not be considered candidates for lab, and that we've also discussed before are patients with significant cardiac disease, poorly controlled hypertension, re underlying renal disease, or high risk of bleeding, prolonged QT interval. Also, what uh, I would point out uh, an issue that I have with many patients, or, or some patients, I should say, are even if they don't have prolonged QT interval, they may be on medications that also prolong the QT interval. And that also that can pose a problem because I have certain patients where the medications cannot be changed and it's quite problematic. Sometimes you can work with the primary doctor to uh, alter medications that allow us to then initiate treatment with lumbatinib. I also think that uh, we have to be careful with patients with non-healing wounds. Uh, if there's tumor with invasion of trachea, esophagus, or great vessels because you can get fistula formation, this also is important in patients who had recently had radiation to localized therapy. Um, I think that also can increase the risk of complications with bleeding and fistula. Also patients with history of colitis, uh, diverticulitis, and very important too is really patients with a poor performance status, nutritional status. This really can be quite difficult. Um, I wanted to mention too, um, there is a phase two, I think, I don't, I actually checked, I didn't see that it was still accruing, but this was this is a phase two trial of lenvatinib uh, with refractory, refractory thyroid cancer who are getting a starting, starting dose of 18 milligram compared to the 24 milligram. So this actually will be interesting to see um, if a lower dose, starting dose will be uh, helpful. So um, really just, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to um, go over the excellent pres presentation and also details provided in the uh, paper on, you know, uh, how to manage and, and evaluate the specific possible uh, toxicities. But I do want to stress, as did Dr. Newbold, this really is like all headed at cancer patients, thyroid cancer is no different. It really takes a multidisciplinary um, team approach. And very important is patient education, um, really to go over all the side effects, the importance of you know, really reporting early uh, any, any toxicities or any concerns. Um, and even I have my nurse, whenever we start somebody, I have my nurse practitioner even reach out to most patients if, if they're not coming in, at, if they're coming at two weeks, even talk to them about one week. Um, and also, I think we have to be very clear when, when we're discussing with our patients, uh, we have to really assess the patient compliance. And you really, you know, you don't want to start one of these medications on, and somebody who uh, may have a poor compliance uh, problem. Just because there can be a risk of, as, as you know, significant problems with hypertension and, and so forth, that if somebody can't, for example, monitor their blood pressure at home and things like that, it's really potentially problematic and could lead to uh, problems. Um, and as Dr. Newbold mentioned, uh, very frequent clinical evaluations, very, very important in the first two months. And we, we really need optimal management of any adverse effect to avoid uh, you know, dose reductions when we don't need to or prolonged dose interruption. Also, as stress, which I agree very, very much, is other physicians really need to be involved very, very uh, closely. And for example, uh, hypertension, as I agree, is 
Dr. Newbold, that's really probably the greatest uh, issue that I have. So I always make sure that, um, and we all do that, you know, the primary care provider or cardiologist is involved. Um, we, we make sure there's good communication, patients have good communication with their doctors so that we can get very rapid uh, adjustment of medications, change of medications as needed, particularly with patients who have hypertension to start with. But that's really a, a big, big issue. Dermatology, I also agree with Dr. Newbold that I really don't see that as a big, big factor. One factor I would mention is that um, stomatitis, which I showed in the one slide, it's mentioned, they give, mentioned grade three or four not being a big problem. But I have to say, I have many patients who do have grade three that's very problematic. And even, um, I have, in fact, I have one patient who was so bad, I finally able to maintain patient actually now for more than a year and a half on 10 milligrams. So it's a low dose, but still getting very good benefit with a widely metastatic disease. Um, but stomatitis, every time any dose increases, just really patient can't eat, can't speak. So to me, that's more, I see a greater uh, problem than sometimes described, but also important to have uh, nephrology involved as needed, endocrinology. Um, the other thing I want to just emphasize in, in sort of closing is that I, I agree with the paper and with many that we really, although there are significant possible toxicities with lumbatinib, we should start with the recommended dose of 24 uh, milligrams. Um, I know some, and I've talked to others who start because of the, you know, they're concerned about toxicity. So in the community, people start at 12 milligrams. And then, uh, and I've talked to even other colleagues at other institutions, don't start 24. I, I truly believe you want to get, you know, the maximum dose. So you should start at 24 milligrams. Don't start at 12. Even at 12, people may, uh, patients may have some side effects. It may be hard to escalate up. So I don't think that should be a strategy. I, I, until, unless we get information that uh, 18 is equal to 24, I, I strongly believe that uh, this is important. That's it. Great. Um, thank you very much uh, to both of you for this outstanding uh, discussion. Um, let me just uh, ask either one of you to respond. Is there um, any role for sequencing or um, uh, switching um, to um, serapinib in uh, patients who don't um, tolerate um, uh, therapy with limbatinib? Or are the crossover of adverse events, and if you could, um, the same and or um, can you talk a little bit about um, whether or not that you would anticipate um, response in someone who either can't tolerate or um, shows progression? Um, I <laughs> so my experience, so first of all, your first um, uh, point about um, pro um, profiling, molecular profiling. So um, with the two drugs that we have, lenvatinib and serapinib, there is no uh, suggestion that we should base the prescription on a mutation. Um, we know that a lot of the activity from both these drugs is their anti-angiogenic um, activity, uh, which is... Um, obviously not dependent on a mutation. So um, for those two drugs, we have not routinely been doing any molecular profiling, and I think that is generally uh, agreed. However, I am now starting to profile my patients once their disease becomes iodine refractory for other things, because there are now other um, actionable targets. So for example, I would look for a RET-PTC fusion because there are RET inhibitors available, NTRAC, which of course would be a very small percentage but may potentially give, a, give options uh, down the line. Um, uh, um, uh, and so I am looking at those uh, and doing BRAF mutations as well. But that's not altering our first line management, which still would be for us in, in the UK, a choice of, of uh, serafinib or lenvatinib. To answer your second question about what do you do in, in second line? So if a patient progresses on uh, lenvatinib, then we don't have any fu anything funded second line in our in the UK, but I would ask um, for a, a clinical trial for which we have um, the COSMIC trial, which is randomizing patients in second line situation between placebo and cabozantinib. And if I didn't have a trial, then I would ask 
for compassionate um, use on an individual basis for the whichever agent I hadn't already used. We are awaiting better data on the response of patients to second line um, uh, um, kinase inhibitor we don't know from going from lenvatinib to serafinib if there will be further response but certainly in the lenvatinib in the select trial uh, a, a reasonable percentage I've forgotten the figure um, perhaps Bruce will know had already been on a kinase inhibitor and had um, e um, uh, equivalent response rates so I think we can assume that there is likely to be and that we shouldn't not try a second line um, kinase inhibitor uh, because I think that there is likely to be some response. And that, of course, is different to a patient who is intolerant to the first one, who you then might switch, um, as opposed to a person that's, present, that's uh, progressed on the first line. So for those that are intolerant, yes, I would then be able to access um, the other, either serafinib or lenvatinib, which were the one I hadn't started with, uh, as essentially first line. Um, and the crossover of toxicities with serafinib, I don't see hypertension as such a problem. So if that had been really difficult with lenvatinib, then serafinib might be a little bit easier. But I do see increased skin problems, particularly hand, foot with serafinib. Yeah, so the only comment I would make is, as you, you mentioned, is, is in the SLEC trial, patients could have received one prior kinase inhibitor. And I forget the exact number, but it was a significant number. And progression-free survival and that group of patients was approximately 15 months. So lower than the 18, but not insignificant. So that gives us, I think, good information that yes, you you can you know, sequence if needed. If a patient stops responding or doesn't tolerate, then there is clear evidence to try another agent. So could you just um, talk a little bit um, about dose reduction um, mitigation of adverse events and then attempts to re-escalate. First of all, how, how often are you able to actually do that? And then the follow-on question is, if you see the, um, disease progression um, with dose reduction, do you, um, do you find that, the, that you're able to get response uh, through um, an attempt to re-escalate? If you could just comment on that. Well, I'll just say first, I'll let Dr. Newell give a second comment. Um, the, you know, obviously, if you're, if you've, de de if you've dropped the dose, you know, there's probably a good reason for it because we do try to keep dose intensity. So, um, when I drop a dose, it's usually a, there's just you know, whether it's for hypertension or stomatitis or this or that, then, um, you know, often you can't go up. So, it, it, I'm not saying that you can't do that as a strategy, but it's not. I don't think that's common for me that I can do that. Um, so the other thing is there are some, um, I would mention too that there are some toxicities, for example, fatigue asthenia. For I have some patients who are on salivatinib for uh, nine months, a year or longer, and they do okay, whether it's at 24 or 20 or, or 14, whatever it is. And then they say, well, they're just having a really, really tough time. And that, um, you know, if you give the patient give the patient a five to seven day break, they feel so much better and they restart the same dose. Um, don't you know? So that's often um, I see that not infrequently. What, what's really amazing to me is we discuss all these. I just wanted I wanted to mention this before, but um, not really your question. But um, is uh, to me when I I have certain certain patients you either start 24 milligrams and that's that. They just do perfectly well no side effects, there's no dose reduction. It's like they're not on, you know, I'm always amazed actually. And I have several patients, like I'm sure Dr. Newbold has the same. It's, it's really quite amazing. Um, but I'll let Dr. Newbold answer your other question. Yeah, no, I completely agree with your comments, Bruce. I mean, it, it is amazing. I, I've had a patient, you know, several patients who've been on 24 milligrams for more than three years and you think, you know what are you doing with it because you had no side effects um but uh, and likewise as with you i've had patients on very low doses who have maintained a um, disease response so i find like you that that because we're very um uh, we really try not to reduce the dose unless we need to, that I rarely go back up with lenvatinib um, because um, usually it's been reduced because they really are intolerant of that level of dose. So I find it difficult to go up. 
I have been tempted when there's been, when I've had a patient on a really low dose, you know, some have gone right down to 10 milligrams, and alternate with four milligrams, 10, four, and then they begin to progress. And then you think, well, maybe if I just up the dose a little bit, um, but I haven't found that that's been successful either in regaining control of the tumour or in um, uh, in avoiding the toxicity that we reduced for. So with lenvatinib specifically, I haven't managed that. Interestingly, I did used to be able to try with serafinib to go back up a little. They often had a lot of diarrhoea to start with and then that tended to settle out. Um, but not with, I don't find it easy with lenvatinib. Great. Can you, this is uh, somewhat of a surgeon's naivety here, but can you speak to the degree of toxicity um, and specifically for lymbatinib as it relates to other forms of targeted therapy? Is this a particularly um, more delicate uh, therapeutic intervention? Um, sorry, Bruce, I'll, I'll just quickly say, I, I, I think that lymbatinib you have to know about the blood pressure because the blood pressure can seriously soar within the first few days. I mean, I've had patients with 220 over 180 blood pressure, you know, so, but, but once you know you've got to look at that and you've got to manage it, then I don't think this is, you know, any more difficult than others to manage. Um, so it is, it is um, active from the anti-VEGF point of view. And as long as you know that and look out for it, then, um, that's okay, but it can take you by surprise if you're, if you're not prepared for it. No, I agree with that comment. I think that's why, you know, I said too, it's, you know, um, that is the biggest problem and, and usually it is manageable. I rarely have to stop patients because of my blood pressure, but that's why it's so important that you do know that your patient is going to be compliant and that, you know, it's, they have to measure their blood pressure at home. It can change. And, as we've seen, you know, within a few weeks, you can have significant change, or even very much sooner than that. So, and that's why I also make it very clear that, you know, we make sure we have a rapid contact. We know who the patient's primary, if the patient has underlying, if they have never had hypertension, obviously we make sure we we are have all the information for the cardiologist or medical doctor, because I don't really want to be the absolute management of hypertension, but we, we're all, we have to be very much on top of it. But um, for patients who have underlying hypertension, we're very clear that they are, should be in contact with their medical doctor, cardiologist before we even start. And we also make sure we have contacts and, you know, we're able, we're, we make sure that we're able to reach the doctor on the same day and really manage these things. Number one, so you don't have a complication, but hopefully too, that you don't get to a severe hyper, you know, hypertensive problem, have grade three hypertension, where you have to stop the dose or for a long time or decrease dose. Great. Um, could you, there is a question from um, one of our participants regarding molecular testing up front, and I would sort of add into that um, specific question: Where does this um, does a multi-kinase inhibitor fit into this um, your treatment paradigm for this um, this group of patients? If you do have a targeted mutation, um, will you go with that specific um, therapy first, or do you keep that in reserve um, if they fail, or um, and lymphatic therapy? Um, well, it's very clear cut for me at the moment because I can't access the um, selected uh, the selective inhibitors. Um, unless patients have had standard of care first. Although, interestingly, this week I've had a medullary thyroid patient uh, who um, uh, has a, a germline rep mutation who has refused to have um, cabazantinib, which is our standard of care, uh, because she wants to have a, a, a less, potentially less toxic um, treatment. And we have been approved to give her a RET inhibitor. So that's done very much on an individual basis. But I think this is going to be a really interesting question as we move forward and these um, drugs are going to be available to us because clearly something specific is likely to be more um, efficacious and hopefully less toxic. Um, I don't know what your situation at the moment is, Bruce, whether you have more flexibility no, not not really. But I think also in this study, there was no, you know, the BRAF or RAS mutation didn't predict, you know, response, you know, in the trial from what I remember. And as far as, you know, whether or not you could have a change in treatment, um, I mean, I think if somebody had a BRAF mutation and they had high risk of bleeding and other things, and sometimes it might be more appropriate to start with 
that. I think um, I'm not sure that we have the information to say for sure if you should, if you do have specific targetable mutation, whether or not you should do that first or the batnin first. Um, you know, it just really depends on maybe some of the toxicity profiles, but um, at least, you know, I don't know that at least, uh, well, I guess I should say, I'm not sure what sequence would be best. I don't think we know that. And we have to play the long game as well, because these patients are going to be on medication for years, hopefully. And so, you know, they will end up having a combination of these these drugs, won't they? So even if they start on the multi-kinase inhibitor, at some point they may end up on a selective one. Um, but the sequencing is is going to be our the next challenge for our uh, research communities to work out when to give what, I think. Great. Listen, thank you both. This is an uh, excellent point to uh, time to end with. And, and I want to thank you both for a really an outstanding discussion. Um, and I want to thank uh, Lil thank Lily Oncology for helping to sponsor uh, this really wonderful session this morning. And so with that, um, I wish everybody a safe and uh, um, uh, hopefully an enjoyable weekend here and look forward to seeing you again next Friday. Thanks once again. Thank Great. you very much. Thanks for having me. Great.